All right, I think we uh, can get started. I see there is quite a good number of people already there. Um, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, my name is Philip Schmidt. I'm going to be your host for today's webinar titled Kubernetes 101, how to run containers in production. With me on the call today, we have Michael Schmidt, uh, CTO at uh, Maze.io, to lead us through the webinar and explain the basics of Kubernetes, what it is, how it works, and why everyone is so excited about it. Uh, throughout the uh, presentation, we will run several short sectional Q&A sessions that allows everyone to ask questions at our roast during the presentation. We will stop quickly, allow you to ask the questions and attend them um, throughout the presentation. Um, uh, you will be able to ask questions at any time during the webinar uh, by using the Q&A function at the center console of your Zoom window at the bottom. That is separate from the chat that uh, some of you have already used to say hello. Um, and we'll be doing our very best to attend uh, those questions in each sectional Q&A, but also dedicated some extra time towards all open questions uh, at the end of the webinar. Uh, right, so without any further ado, um, over to uh, today's speaker, um, Michael, the floor is yours. Hello, everybody, and yeah, welcome to Kubernetes 101, how to run containers in production. Um, today, we're going to talk a lot about containers, but maybe shortly for the people that maybe have not heard about Amazio, just one short slide. Um, Amazio, we do uh, container hosting, we do fully managed container hosting, and we have a tool called Lagoon that we're going to hear later a bit more about. And um, basically with us, you can host anywhere in the world. We do chat support and not ticketing support. So uh, you can talk to our engineers directly. Everything we do is completely open source. We really believe that everything in these days should be open source and that's why our whole platform is open source and that's why we also use open source like Kubernetes. And we have a couple of different clients from governments, financial services, all kind of stuff. So we use Kubernetes on a daily basis uh, within a Maze IO. And um, so <clears throat> we said, okay, let's, let's create a webinar where we give everybody a bit of deeper in knowledge on what Kubernetes is and how it works. And today we're gonna to really go over the basics and we're planning a second webinar for Kubernetes 102, where we maybe go a bit deeper into technical things and, and the weeds of it. But today we're gonna to talk about what is Kubernetes and why do we need an orchestrator? We're gonna talk about how Kubernetes fits in a hosting stack. We're gonna talk about Kubernetes overall concepts and we're gonna look into um, the the individual Kubernetes objects that um, you can use to create um, your um, host. So let's look first, what is Kubernetes? So Kubernetes, also called QQAS or Cube, and the Q8S comes from to not actually write all the Ubernete, and so you just write K8S or Cube, and is an open source, very important for us, an open source container orchestration system. Um, it is based on Docker, specifically actually on the Open Container Initiative. So um, Docker, which is a way how to describe Docker images and a lot of other things, um, has now a specification that is called OCI and that defines how a Docker image needs to be set up. and Kubernetes can run these, um, these container images. Originally, Kubernetes was implemented by Google, and today there is a foundation started to call it the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, which maintains and pushes Kubernetes um, forward. The CNCF, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, also have other tools that are also part of them. So it's actually starting to be a whole ecosystem and we'll see later why we actually need an ecosystem around it. And really interesting, um, as of this year, 40% of the 5,000 uh, 5, enterprise companies that have been asked are already running Kubernetes in production. So there has definitely been in the past other alternatives around Kubernetes, things like Mesosphere, Docker Swarm and other stuff. Um, but today, Kubernetes is definitely the most used 
um, container orchestration system. And um, if there ever has been a war around the orchestration system, uh, as of today, Kubernetes is definitely at the forefront. So we heard Kubernetes is an orchestrator, but why do we even need one? So, and in order to understand why we need an orchestrator, I wanna shortly look into how could we actually run containers in production without an orchestrator? So let's say you have a Docker image of an Nginx or a PHP or something, and you wanna run that now in production. Now, if you just have plain Docker, you could run, like you can do Docker run, the image and your container is running. Maybe you realize quite fast, this is not really gonna uh, go very well because this is really the bare, um, the bare bone way. And so you maybe think about, okay, there's got Docker Compose, I can use Docker Compose and that works. You can run your containers in production with Docker Compose. The problem is you very fast will have a lot of pieces missing. And the first of them is you will not be able to run these containers on multiple servers. Um, or if you do, you have to decide which container is running on which server. So there's the first um, problem. What do you do if one of these servers go down? Or if you want to add a server to, the, to something? Then rolling deployments. Your containers might have updates. So um, usually in Docker Compose and Docker World, you stop a container and then you start a new one. Now during the time of the stopping and starting, your site will be down and or your application will not work. So we want something like rolling deployments, which is also not provided. Then no auto scaling. Um, containers make it really easy to start and stop new versions of them or fast if you want to scale up. Um, you need a system that monitors the usage of the containers and starts you know, more of them. No rollbacks. If you deploy something and you realize that it's actually the wrong thing, how can you go back? So basically, not a lot. You can run, you can use Docker Run and Docker Compose, but you really want to use an orchestrator because a control, an orchestrator helps us with many, many of these things and, and makes it much easier to run containers in production. So let's actually look at what an orchestrator does. First of all, it manages machines. Within the Kubernetes world, they're called nodes, and so we're going to use that term. But basically, the machines or the nodes are what is actually running the containers. And that's already the very first quite weird thing if you start using Kubernetes is that you don't tell Kubernetes on which node you want to run a container. Kubernetes does that for you. There are ways to decide and place specific containers on specific nodes, but usually, Contain, um, uh, Kubernetes does that for you. So in our case, for example, at MACIO, where we have clusters with 20, 30 nodes, we don't know anymore which pod is, or sorry, which container is running on which node. That can be quite confusing and quite challenging at the beginning, because as a hosting team, we are usually very know very well what is running where, but Kubernetes takes that over for you. And of course, you can still figure out where a node where a pod or a container is running, but you don't actually need to know. And the really cool thing is because of that, you can actually add and remove nodes at any time. So if you need more um, and more resources, you add additional nodes to the cluster or you can remove them. An orchestrator also can scale up containers up and down. So if you tell the orchestrator to run 10 containers, it will run 10. If you tell it to run 20, it will run 20 for you and the other way, vice versa. Then we can do deployments of new containers. So if you wanna update a container, it will, um, it will do that for you. And it can also handle rollbacks because it knows um, which version has been running before and it can automatically go back. Um, it also does a lot of monitoring around the nodes and the containers. So the nodes are constantly monitored. Are they healthy? Do they have enough CPU? Is the memory, memory full? Um, is the storage behaving correctly? All these things, the same for the containers. Each container has a health check where you can teach an orchestrator how to check if the container is actually healthy. So in terms of um, PHP, you can check if it has enough um, PHP workers available. For Nginx, you can make sure that it's um, handling the requests correctly. 
And if something goes wrong, the orchestrator will automatically restart the containers for you and maybe even place them on either machines or nodes if um, the orchestrator realized that the node might have an issue or might have a health um, problem. So it does that constantly for you and it's not something that um, anybody actually has to take an active part of it. It's done automatically. Orchestrators also provide storage connections for storage systems. And we're just going to hear later a bit how that exactly works, but basically it does all kind of storage stuff. And orchestrators also do namespacing to place multiple containers into a namespace where they belong and talk, talk to each other. And it also does access control. So it allows multiple containers to not talk to each other. And um, orchestrators usually also do secret and configuration management. So if you want to have a configuration saved outside of a container, you can do that the same with secrets because you don't want to put the secret into a Docker image. And it also does a lot of uh, internal DNS. So an orchestrator usually also have an internal DNS where the different pods and containers can talk with each other. So you see an orchestrator does a lot of stuff. And um, it's, it's a little bit a beast. Uh, it can be quite complex to understand how everything works. But luckily, um, Kubernetes is very easy to learn. And there, um, and it's, it's, you don't need to know all of these things down to the how exactly it works. Um, and they are really easily abstracted um, for you, and you can start um, using it and learn it right away. So let's look at how Kubernetes, which is our Docker orchestrator, fits into a stack. And on the left side, we have a standard hosting stack that you probably have seen before. At the bottom, we have all kind of actually hardware. So networking, storage, and servers, plus many infrastructures today are virtualized. So that's a lot of stuff there. Then you probably have some kind of infrastructure config where you define all this stuff below. So in terms of AWS, that would be where you define your VPCs and your local answers, your subnets and the EC2s and all that stuff. And the same for other um, platforms. Then you have an operating system. And then we actually go into the orchestrator and the Kubernetes. And that's where, and on the containers, and that's where Kubernetes comes in. So Kubernetes makes sure that the containers are placed on the correct, um, on the correct nodes and that they work in a good way. But then on top, you actually have the services. So these are things like PHP, Nginx, and MariaDB, or all kind of stuff that is running in there. That's not handled by Kubernetes. And of course, the application itself, what you're going to put into the application and the data of the application, um, of course, is not handled or is not managed by Kubernetes. So we see Kubernetes actually does only a small part of the whole um, infrastructure. It does an important part of the infrastructure, but it doesn't do anything, um, everything. So it needs a running infrastructure. We can see that here. Um, it also um, needs an operating system. And the really cool thing about Kubernetes it actually runs on many different operating systems. It's even possible, even though the most time it's, uh, it's Linux, but it's also possible to run Kubernetes on Microsoft infrastructure and to run like Windows containers. Um, important is that Kubernetes is completely application agnostic. Kubernetes does not care what you're actually running inside the containers. So you can put whatever you want, you can put in there. Plus, you can also run almost every service. So PHP, Nginx, Apache, Elasticsearch, everything today you can put into a container. And if you can put it into a container, you can also run it on Kubernetes. Again, Kubernetes does not really care what exactly is running in these containers. So we heard a lot about what Kubernetes is, but I also want to shortly focus on what Kubernetes is not, because I feel today there is Kubernetes is a lot of used for this one shoot shot solution that solves everything. And you will see quite fast this is actually not the case. First of all, Kubernetes does not manage your operating system. And there are today operating systems that interact with Kubernetes, but at the end, it's still the responsibility of an operations team to make sure that the operating system is up to date, that it is secure, that it is hardened, that it works, that it's running, that nothing bad happens. This is some 
something that is still responsible um, and is not going to be handled by Kubernetes. The other thing is Kubernetes will not build your Docker images. Kubernetes expects a Docker image in a Docker registry that Kubernetes can pull from and run the containers. How you build these Docker images, Kubernetes doesn't care. Um, Kubernetes just expects that the image is somehow there. Kubernetes has no understanding of what is actually running inside the container. Um, so because it doesn't care, it also doesn't know anything. So Kubernetes has no idea what Drupal is, or it has no idea what PHP is. All of this needs to be teached to Kubernetes and explained how it should behave or how it should handle. Um, also, Kubernetes does not provide any middleware, let's say queuing systems or databases like MySQL or Elasticsearch or any data processing system. All of this is not provided by Kubernetes. You can run these things inside Kubernetes, but Kubernetes out of the box does not provide you with a database, for example. And Kubernetes also out of the box does not provide you with any logging system, monitoring system, or alerting system. A very important part if you want to run stuff in production, you need these things to know what's going on inside your cluster. There are good tools that you can deploy on top of Kubernetes. And that work really well with Kubernetes, but out of the box, Kubernetes does not come with them included. Like Kubernetes does not provide databases, it also does not provide any storage solutions by itself. It can connect to external storages and handle it and make it easier, but it does not actually provide any storage solutions in itself. <laughs> so, we heard a lot about Kubernetes, what it is, what it is not. Before we jump more into um, into a bit deeper, are there already some first questions? For you? Yes, we have um, Brian asking, uh, so a node is a physical or virtual server, like a bar metal server or an EC2 instance or something like that? So that's a really good question. Kubernetes actually doesn't care. A node is basically just something that has, an, that has an operating system running that you install a tool called Kubernetes Kubelet um, on it, and that will make that node part or will in, um, register itself part um, inside the cluster and will allow the orchestrator to orchestrate or schedule containers on the node itself. Um, but it can be a bare metal, it can be a virtual machine, it could be um, even a Raspberry Pi or things like that. It really doesn't matter. Many times and how we at Amazio run them, they're all virtual machines and because they're easily to scale, they're easily to handle, you can make images that you can start and stop. But at the end, um, it really doesn't matter um, where or what exactly a node is running. All right, that would be everything for now. I haven't cool. seen anything else come in. Um, I think we can just move on. Cool, all right. Okay, let's go a bit deeper into the concepts of Kubernetes. Many of you already heard, but let's make them shortly um, clear. So the first thing is Kubernetes, you interact with Kubernetes through an API. Probably no surprise, but there is an API that you talk with Kubernetes. Very important is the Kubernetes API is declarative. This means you define what you need and Kubernetes gets you there. So short example, let's say you have um, of one service, you have running three containers and now you want, uh, you want to add in another seven. It, you don't tell Kubernetes, hey Kubernetes, please add another seven. You tell Kubernetes, I want 10. And then Kubernetes realizes, oh, you already have three, so I will start at another seven. So you always tell Kubernetes what you want, and Kubernetes will get you there. And you do that with so called Kubernetes objects. We're going to look at them later, their pods, services, etc. But you, via the API, you define objects. And these objects can be either be in YAML or in JSON. Um, so you can define in two ways. You can talk to, um, to the Kubernetes API um, about them. If it's human readable, a lot of times it's YAML. 
um, APIs, like machines, obviously use JSON a bit more, but at the end, it doesn't matter. But via that API, you tell Kubernetes what you want, and Kubernetes is going to give it um, to you. The API obviously also gives you statuses, and you can see how many parts are currently running, what's happening with the parts, and all that stuff. But um, um, this is how it works. Um, there is one thing that we need to know about that is a called the Kubernetes cluster. And basically, a Kubernetes cluster just consists in the simplest form um, out of masters and nodes. And so if we talk, go a bit more, if we uh, go into the masters or also called the control plane, um, this is what actually manages and orchestrates the cluster. So the control plane is a couple of services that is running on master nodes or master machines. And in there is running the API, there are some schedulers, there are controllers and all that stuff. And together, they create the orchestrator. Kubernetes, you can already hear it, Kubernetes is a microservice architecture. So it's not one tool that you start on one server and that's it. It's actually a group of a lot of services working in tandem in parallel together that create together that orchestration. So that's one part of the cluster. And um, oh, and I forgot the control plane is actually where the API is running. So the API, when you talk to the Kubernetes API, you talk to the masters where the API is running. And then we have nodes. And as we already heard, nodes is what actually runs the containers. And um, fun fact, the masters are actually also nodes, but that goes a bit too deep into it. Um, but the nodes is usually where the containers um, that you define for Kubernetes to schedule and deploy, and you can define where that should run. And these, the nodes are orchestrated by the masters. And we can also, and it's also possible to put pods or containers into namespaces. So um, where the namespaces allow you grouping of, of objects. So for example, at Amazio, what we do is that the production environments and development environments are each one namespace, so they are separate. So that um, you can make sure that they don't kind of, cannot talk with each other, um, but we internally within the namespace they can easily talk with each other and stuff like that. So it's just easier to namespace stuff around because you can end up quite fast with a lot of objects and a lot of um, pieces. So I want to now also go a bit into how such a cluster could look like. Um, so the easiest solution is pretty much just one machine and you deploy the masters and the nodes on top of them. And you maybe heard about the tool called Minikube, and that's a tool that allows you to run a Kubernetes cluster locally on your own computer. And this is basically what Minikube does. And it's the smallest amount of possible, it's the easiest to start, but you have no redundancy at all. Like if, if that, if your computer goes down or if the server that you run that goes down or has a problem, everything is gone and it might come back, but while it is down, it's not gonna work. So because of that, people obviously start to have redundancies. And the easiest way of redundancy is having one master, two or more nodes. So this is how it looks then. So you split up the masters and the nodes. The master is orchestrating the nodes. If one of the nodes has the problem, because that's where the actual workload runs, so that's usually where problems maybe occur, and you can start and add them. You can see, we actually have server three plus, so you could add additional nodes to that cluster as you need and you can remove them as you want. Um, and so we have redundancy on the node level. If a node dies, we have another one that could take over, but we don't have redundancies on masters. So because of that, um, we can then create two masters. So Kubernetes actually can have multiple control planes that synchronize each other all the time. So they they make sure that the, um, that the internal database that Kubernetes uses to save all the objects and stuff, this one is, is um, replicated across all masters. And so this is then how this looks like, where two masters together work all the time and you have another two servers and with additional nodes and you can add them if you need them or you can remove them. Um, this means though that if you lose one node and and then you have a so-called split brain situation. So you're never really sure which of the two masters is really the best. So if you want to really do it in a better way, you actually do three plus three. This means you have three masters that are synchronized each other. 
if one of them have a problem, the other two can still take over. And if the third one comes back, it knows, oh, I was alone, things like that. So high available, high redundancy systems. And of course, on the nodes, the same. Plus again, you can have server six plus where you could add additional servers. This is how um, we run our production clusters, but it's definitely not necessary to do that from the very beginning. If you just want to play with it and learn with it, that's def you can start with Minikube, but just be, be aware um, running stuff in production, always think about the worst case situations. How do you handle them? And so if you really plan to run the Kubernetes in production, I suggest you to run at least two masters, two nodes, or maybe three masters, three nodes. Cool. Another short break. Um, do we have more questions, Philip? Not at this point. If anyone would like to post something towards us, you can do this right now. Yes, another one coming in. So a redundant production cluster would need a minimum of four servers. Yes, it is. Um, I would suggest to, if you want to run a system like this, um, I would suggest to run four um, servers. So this can, for example, this could be, um, let's say you use AWS, this could be four EC2 instances where you have two of them are masters and two of them um, are nodes. And this gives you a really good, nice, rather than system if one of the nodes has a problem or you need to upgrade it or you need to restart it, you will not cause any outages or problems to your cluster. And there is obviously a lot of different ways you could do things like that you dis that one of the master also runs some of the nodes and stuff like that. So there is a lot of different ways of doing it, but this is really, if you wanna have a good solid system, that's what I would suggest as minimum for production and clusters. Wonderful. Um, Carlos is asking, I've heard split brain for masters. Are they active or passive? So the masters in a, in a Kubernetes clusters are always active. So in, let's say in a three of them, all of them, they're always, they're able to receive API calls. The nodes here, they actually just talk to the masters randomly, round robin. So there is no active or slave or active or passive or um, failover systems. All of them are active at any time, can receive requests um, and, and handle them for you. So it's not something that you need to be um, too much worried about how all of this works. All right, that looks like everything for now. I think we can move on. Cool. Oh, hold on. We had one last, uh, yeah. last minute <laughs> submission. Um, I talk to masters, do you compute nodes? Uh, do compute nodes need a load balancer? No. Um, the compute nodes themselves don't need a load balancer in front of them, but we will see now as we talk into the object how like traffic could actually flow and stuff like that. And so um, we're going to see that right now. Okay, wonderful. Let's move on. Cool, okay, let's talk about the Kubernetes objects. The first one, you probably heard it me already slipping, is that actually using pod instead of containers. And so a pod is actually the smallest entity that is deployed into a Kubernetes cluster. And um, Kubernetes actually created the, the concept of a pod and not of a container, because one pod can actually contain one or more containers. And the reason is that, that Kubernetes said there are cases where two containers always need to stay together. They always need to start together and they need to stop together. In Drupal, and if you look into how we run it, for example, we run the Nginx and the PHP containers together in one pod because they talk so much with each other and you always need one of them together anyway, we decided to put them together into a pod. So in Kubernetes, you do not deploy a container, you deploy a pod, which has either one container as the easiest or multiple of them. And um, the good thing is that if you deploy a pod, 
the pod is placed on the node. So your containers will always be running on the same node. Therefore, they have very fast networking between them. And so because pods is actually the thing that you deploy, you're also not telling Kubernetes, hey, I want 10 containers. You actually tell um, Kubernetes, I want 10 pods. Now, if these 10 pods, each of them have two containers, you will end up with 20 containers. But you will always tell um, pods to, um, to be deployed and to be running. The next thing maybe sounds crazy at the beginning, pods can actually not be updated. So you cannot go into a, into a pod and let's say change the Docker image for one of the containers or change an environment variable. And um, Kubernetes will prevent you from, do, from doing this because Kubernetes says, if you want a change in your pod, create a new pod and remove the old one. And so um, this means um, you cannot go into it and directly change it. The same around the IP. So each pod in a Kubernetes cluster gets an automatically assigned IP address. And this one changes every single time a pod comes up, it has a brand new IP address. It's not really predictable. So there's another thing that we need to make sure that we can handle this. So let's first look at the deployments. There is an object in Kubernetes called deployments and they control replicas and status of pods. And so this means in a deployment, you for example say which image you wanna run in which container in which pod. That's where you define the actual image because you can't define it on the pods because you can change it. But in the deployment, um, you can change, you can go in there and you can change it. And then the deployment will actually handle the rollout for you. So if you tell the deployment, I need three pods with each of them two containers and that has an Nginx image and the PHP image, for example, then the deployment will roll that out for you and will make sure that there are three running. If, for example, the deployment fails and stuff like that, it will um, do that. So it will start new pods for you. It will wait until these new pods are ready while the old ones are still running. And then when the new ones are ready, it will stop the old pods. That's called a rolling rollout or a rolling deployment. There are also other strategies that we're not gonna go into it today, but this is the standard way how it does it. Starts new pods, waits until they're ready and stops all pods. And that also means your site, let's say your Drupal site is not gonna be down because there's always pods available um, um, for, to handle the traffic. So if you wanna create pods, and it means if you wanna create containers in your Kubernetes cluster, you don't create individual pods, you create deployments that describes um, what you want and then the deployment will run it for you and it will handle it and you're gonna have a much better experience than if you try to create pods individually because very fast you will run into issues. So that's around deployments. Now we heard before we um, pods have changing IP addresses and that's gonna be hard again. So how does that work? Therein comes an object called services. So services provide a stable IP address in a cluster. If you create a service, and um, by an object, by a Kubernetes object, it will get an IP and that IP will not change unless you delete the service that you created, but usually you don't do that, so you have a stable IP. The other cool thing is because Kubernetes comes with an internal DNS, you can actually use a DNS. So, um, so each service has a nice name that is, um, that you can um, uh, use anywhere in the cluster, which is service name, dot namespace name, dot svc, dot cluster, dot local. This is just the default, this all can be changed. But um, so you don't even need to know the IP addresses because yes, handling IP addresses is quite hard and there's easy typos where nice URLs are much easier to be used. And the services, they forward traffic to one or more pods. So if a service receives traffic, um, it will then forward that to the pods. That's all the service does. And because it can actually forward to more than just one pod, so let's say you have 10 um, of our Drupal container or Drupal pods, um, then the service can forward to all 10 of them. So it does something like load balancing across multiple pods. And that's really cool because if you, let's say the deployment, you have two pods and now you say, oh, I want 10, 
you don't need to go to any load balancer and explain something, hey, oh, I just added 10 new, because the service figures out by itself to which pod it should forward, and this all happens fully automatically. The same for rolling deployments. The, the services will see that there's a rolling deployment and will handle the traffic accordingly and all that stuff. You need to define the port. So each of the service, you need to open the port. So it's not that like automatically you can talk to every single um, port, um, port of pod. So it also adds some kind of firewalling. It's not a real firewall, but it, add, add, it adds some possibilities that you can define, okay, which pods should actually, which ports have been open, which makes a lot of things easier. But there are no public domains or URLs. Services provide IP addresses, maybe an internal DNS uh, um, name, but not public domains. So if you want external public domains, like let's say www.example.com, you need something else. In comes ingress. Ingress is a bit a special object in Kubernetes, and it's sometimes a bit confusing. But what an ingress does, it basically provides public domains or URLs, like we heard, www.amazing.example.com, um, to services. So if you want to expose your pods to the internet, you can group these pods together with services, and you add an ingress to that service that forwards the traffic to the service. Now, the confusing part about this is ingress is, is actually not something that Kubernetes has natively. Um, instead, it uses existing services and you have an ingress controller. And Kubernetes specifically said, we know that people like HFrox, other people like Nginx, other people like traffic, we have people that use proprietary things. So because of that, Kubernetes said, okay, we're not gonna reinvent the wheel here. And we're gonna just support all these existing tools, so like HIProxy or Nginx. And so what happens is that you deploy an ingress controller into Kubernetes. And that ingress controller basically sees all ingress objects created by all the namespaces, and it will then automatically create, for example, an HIProxy config dependent on all these ingress objects, and it will manage a running HA proxy inside the cluster that then itself will be know how to forward, um, uh, how to forward um, traffic, like re um, HTTP requests um, to that side. Again, it's a bit confusing, but it's actually quite easy to deploy these things because every cluster needs something like that. They are super easy to deploy. If you search for ingress controllers, you can choose which one you want to use and um, you can deploy them in there and that's pretty much it. They all handle everything for you. You don't need to know how to write HAProxy config or Nginx or stuff like that, but um, it is something that you need because by default, you cannot expose your traffic. The other special things around that is usually in most cases, SSL certificates are actually handled on this ingress. So for example, on an HA proxy is that the HA proxy knows every single SSL certificate for every single service in your cluster, and it will do the SSL handling there. And then the traffic to the pods um, will not be, uh, maybe could be re-encrypted, but not with an actual public certificate. And you do that because we heard before, because the pods can start and stop at any time and handling SSL certificates is just very hard in a lot of different places. So you wanna have a more centralized way where um, you have these, um, um, where you handle the SSL certificate. And many um, ingress controllers today have let's encrypting um, functionality so they can automatically create your SSL certificates and all that kind of stuff. So now we heard how we get traffic in um, from a pod to services to ingresses. The last piece we also need to talk about is storage. Um, Drupal specifically, but also many other um, systems, they want at one point, they might wanna have some um, persistent storage. And so how this works is that deployment and pods can define with an object called um, PVC, which is persistent volume claim. And you can hear in the word claim, 
they basically say what they want. So as an Nginx pod, I could say, for example, I would like to have 10 gigabytes of storage and I need this amount of speed or I want this type of storage and stuff like that. And then Kubernetes, what we'll do, Kubernetes will see that claim and it will actually talk to the storage solution and creates that storage and does it. So for example, in AWS, it would actually talk to the AWS API and for example, create an EBS volume or create an EFS volume. Kubernetes also has integration into Azure disks, which is the equivalent to the storage. Um, or you can also talk to a Ceph cluster, to a cluster FS, to any other, to NFS. Kubernetes has, in, um, has capabilities to connect to all kinds of storage solutions that exist out there. So the pods themselves, they don't need to know what exact storage tool we have, or they don't need to know how do I talk to a Ceph cluster, for example. All they do is they create a claim. They say, I want that amount of storage and please connect it in my pod in, in that folder. And Kubernetes will do all of that, will handle it, will attach it, will make sure that it will not go down because that's the persistent part and um, all that stuff. And so this is where really, um, where the storage really comes in because running containers in production is really cool and these auto scaling pods are starting and stopping is obviously very nice and um, but very fast you will need some kind of persistent storage to handle all of this and that's where kubernetes can actually help you okay and um, before we continue philip more questions yes we have another one from carlos he's asking can load balancers provided by cloud services such as aws azure google cloud be used as ingresses yes and no so there i would say we go a bit into the weeds of it and um, usually you still want to create an ingress controller or an ingress inside your cluster because that ingress needs to know a lot about your cluster. It needs to know about every single service that is running inside um, the cluster. It needs to know about every single pod. So having this running inside the cluster is much, much easier than trying to run it externally. But how you actually create these, because you don't want to have one single ingress in your cluster, because again, if that one goes down, you have a problem. So what you usually do is you run, let's say two or three of these ingresses in your cluster, and then in front of these three ingresses, you put a load balancer, like an elastic load balancer and an Azure load balancer. And, then, and that load balancer by the provider load balances between the ingresses, and the ingresses then load balance between all the services. This is gonna be a topic of Kubernetes 102, where we're gonna go into a bit deeper how a real cluster will look like and what we additionally need. Um, but yes, um, this is how um, it's usually done. That being said, Asterix, there is ways that you can use um, a cloud load balancer already as your ingress controllers. Again, it's open source, so people come up with all kinds of different solutions. But so far, what I've seen most of the time, you use an ingress and a load balancer to load balance between multiple ingresses. All right, that's all open questions for now. I think we can move cool. on. Okay. So, and um, we heard now about what Kubernetes is. We heard about the different objects. And a lot of people actually come to us and say like, why do I need Lagoon? Um, because I already have Kubernetes, so why do I need that? So Lagoon actually adds stuff on top of this. Lagoon comes into place. Lagoon brings you some of the functionality that is Kubernetes either does not provide or is quite complex to understand. So. First of all, the most important thing we heard before is Kubernetes does not actually build your Docker images. Lagoon does that for you. Lagoon brings a solution that has a Docker host where you can tell Lagoon, please build these Docker images. So developers don't need to locally build Docker images and push them to registries and all that kind of stuff. You can push a Git repository with a Docker file and Lagoon will build your Docker images and will push them into the registry for you. Um, the other one is that Lagoon has base images for many um, or has for services and applications. Running applications like Drupal, Nginx, PHP, Elasticsearch, whatever you want in containers can be quite complex. 
and needs a lot of upfront learning and how this works. So Lagoon brings that with it. And because it's open source, you can see what happens, but you can use that. The other thing is also Lagoon knows which objects are needed. So if, for example, if you say, I need a MariaDB, Lagoon knows, okay, you need persistent storage, you need a deployment, but it cannot be a rolling deployment because the rolling deployment doesn't work with MySQL, so it creates another strategy, all that kind of stuff. That is all known in Lagoon, and Lagoon will talk to the Kubernetes API and explains to and Kubernetes what to do. So that means Lagoon actually is the piece that talks to the Kubernetes API and to creates the objects. It also updates objects. It realizes that an object already exists and only puts the changes in it and stuff like that. So that's where uh, Lagoon comes in. Plus Lagoon creates all the different namespaces. Like for each branch and pull requests and things like that, Lagoon will create individual namespaces for it to make sure they're separate and, um, and um, independent. And Lagoon can also run um, pre and post deployment scripts. So um, whenever you um, deploy like an application, you maybe want to run some database changes and database updates and stuff like that. And all of this can Lagoon do for you. So Lagoon will wait, for example, until a rollout of new parts is done. And after all that is done, Lagoon will do that for you. And everything in Lagoon is fully automated and scriptable. So it makes it much easier to integrate with a Kubernetes cluster and um, with Lagoon together. So, um, and this is actually why we as AmazeIO started Lagoon and also made it open source. And because we really saw that Kubernetes is awesome. It's really cool. It, uh, it opens up so many possibilities, but to use it on a daily basis, and especially with a lot of developers that maybe don't know everything about Kubernetes yet, um, it's really important that you make a system and that's what Lagoon provides and can help you in doing. And of course, if you don't want to worry about anything of that, if you don't want to worry about updating operating systems, running clusters, scaling them, monitoring them, all of that, um, we can do all of this because as an AZIO, we actually provide you that. All right, that was Kubernetes 101. I hope we all learned much more. Um, if we have more questions at the end, I'm happy to answer them now. Uh, not at this point, but I think we could give the attendees maybe a minute to post anything. Um, ah, yeah, we've got one. Is Lagoon similar to pipelines? Maybe we need to shortly know what exactly pipelines means. Or what, the, what do you understand on the pipelines? Asking the, the person that asked. Bitbucket pipelines? Okay. Yes. So technically, you could implement everything that Lagoon does in, for example, Bitbucket pipelines or any other CI, CD system that is out there. Technically, this is possible, but it's obviously going to be quite some work and quite some stuff um, to do all of this. So, um, and we actually, Lagoon integrates with pipelines or any other CI, CD systems that um, exist out there. So it could, for example, do so first some testing and then afterwards um, it automatically does um, the rollout deployments. But if you actually go back into the history of Lagoon, you can see that the very, very first implementation of Lagoon was done in Jenkins files. And then we realized quite fast that this is not going to scale. But um, yes, it is technically possible. But usually today, many companies actually integrate it. Okay, at this point, there is nothing else coming up, giving the people another few seconds to pose a question. And of course, maybe while people do that, um, you can always come to us. Like, we love Kubernetes, we love to share knowledge. That's why everything is open source. So, um, you can join the Amazing Slack like, if you ever have a problem, or meet us at events, and we're happy to explain you how things work. And we really believe that Kubernetes is a really good solution. And so the more people know a bit, the better. Wonderful. We have another question from Jeremy Dickens, who is asking, is there any value to running Kubernetes locally or is that overkill for local development? That's a really good question. And I, it's quite, it's a, I don't have an 100% answer for you. So if you, 
I think it really depends on who you are. If you want to learn how Kubernetes works and understand how all of these objects work and how do they interact and delete a pod and see how it starts again, for that, Kubernetes locally is really great because you don't need to run, you know, you don't need to cluster, you can have everything run locally and you can, you can shoot at it, you can delete stuff and see how it happens. So to learn Kubernetes itself, to see how it works to test, it's, it's great. On the other side, if you want to deploy or if you want to develop inside containers, I don't think it makes sense to run Kubernetes locally. We as Amazing.io still suggest Docker Compose because it's a much better and a much easier um, way of running things within, your, uh, within local. And you can stop and start, stop and start them very easily. Um, storage attaching is much easier while running it non natively in Kubernetes, it is all possible, but it's not as easy. So I suggest if you, if you are, let's say, a Drupal, a WordPress, Symfony, Laravel developer and want to just use containers, use Docker Compose. If you are a system engineer, an operations person that wants to learn about Kubernetes or if just you want to play with Kubernetes by itself, running Kubernetes locally for testing is great. Wonderful. We have a few more questions coming through. Um, the next one would be from Matthew Connerton asking, is it safe to run MySQL in a pod on prod or should we aim for a managed database service instead? <laughs> I think that could be its own webinar. Um, out, like out of the blue, there is a lot of different things. You can do both and we as Amazi actually do both. Some of the um, some of the containers, we run MariaDBs inside the containers and that works great um, for specific cases, which mostly is if you need specific changes on your MariaDB config or your MySQL config or any other database config, that is great um, because some of the managed um, database providers like RDS or uh, Azure databases, stuff like that, they do not provide you or allow you to change everything. But on the other hand, you get also the downsides. Um, container restarts are very quite slow with MariaDB. So this means sometimes the database is, out, is not working, stuff like that. I would suggest by default, you, if, you wanna do, if you wanna do production stuff, use a shared database or a managed database like RDS. You're gonna be happier at the beginning and because it's a less piece to worry about, especially if you start the pods and the storage and all that stuff is already a lot to worry about. So use a managed um, database at the beginning and then over time you maybe learn and you can maybe start using MariaDBs for let's say your development environments that only exist for a couple of hours and are not actual production stuff. Um, so long story short, start with managed and maybe over time you can start using the, the, the individual ones in containers. All right, there's a follow-up from Matthew, which is what storage backend do you aim for when they are in pods? Something that can handle databases. So yes, the question is around, um, you can, for example, not use EFS. EFS is an NFS um, based system where you cannot run databases in it. We as a Maze IO, um, we do two things, either if we have EBS volumes or some kind of block storage volumes, um, like um, Cinder volumes in OpenStack and stuff like that, we use them. So we run the databases on EBS, for example. Um, some of the clusters, we don't have that. And then we actually deploy another cluster FS on top of that, that then provides us um, an, a storage solution on top of this. But you definitely make sure that your storage solution that you choose is made for databases. Because you can maybe try to start it on NFS or S3 or things like that, but usually that doesn't really work and you're gonna have a lot of problems in the future. Okay, great. Uh, Justin is asking, any cool stuff being worked on with Lagoon? What's on the roadmap for the future? Good question. So we are really close to do um, Lagoon 1.0.0, which is going to be very exciting. It's going to also have some API and changes because it's a major update, but we're going to bring role-based access control to Lagoon, um, which will allow our customers to more finally grade provide permissions 
So we're going to have things like guests, which can only see the Lagoon UI. They cannot redeploy. They cannot do anything. Um, we're going to have things like um, accounts, which only have access to development environments, but not production environments and stuff like that. We're also going to bring groups um, to the place so you can have additional groups where you can um, represent your actual team structure within Lagoon, um, which we really believe that is going to make a lot of things easier um, and a lot of things um, uh, better. So that's the really short term um, things that we're working on. And in the future, we are working on better integrations with Kubernetes natively. We are um, thinking about rebuilding the whole logging infrastructure. We are thinking about providing more monitoring to customers so that you can see like Grafana dashboards, what happens in your pod. So there's a lot of exciting stuff to come. Uh, stay tuned, read our blog, read the Lagoon releases, and you will be the first to know. Wonderful. I think that should round up the Q&A at the end of the presentation. Um, if there are any more questions at any given time, please feel free to send us an email to webinars at amaze.com or any other email address you can find on one of our websites. Um, thank you, ev like everyone, for attending today. I hope you enjoyed the presentation. Obviously, also a um, big thank you to Michael for leading us through the program and the presentation today. Um, we will, as always, provide all of you with a recording of this webinar that you can rewatch um, this presentation or share it with one of your colleagues that has missed the presentation um, and couldn't make it. Um, as Michael already said, we will uh, come up with uh, follow-up webinars quite soon. Uh, one of the uh, next ones will be uh, Kubernetes 102 and amongst others. So stay tuned. We will keep you updated by email and our social channels as per usual. Thank you very much. I'll see you at the next one.